Sports Show presents House of Rugby. Hello and you're all very welcome to House of Rugby. My name is Maura trassany and I'm delighted to be joined on this week's show by the chop tackle king, Will Connors, and by our own wrecking ball herself, <laughs> Lindsay Pete. How are we both doing? Yeah, no, good. Yeah, no tipping good. away. Good to be here. Yeah. Will, it's great to have you here. Before we get stuck into Six Nations, let's talk about Leinster. They're in a good place at the moment. You're top of the URC, true to the round of 16s in Europe. Um, personally for you, how do you feel the season's been going? Yeah, no, it's been enjoyable. Uh, just kind of have had some some fun games. Uh, getting back into it, I think it's been a frustrating few seasons with injuries and stuff but like this is the first time now in a while touch wood that I've had a kind of a run of games and yeah you know being being in amongst it um, is class so just trying to keep the body fresh and keep getting back out there Talking about fun games that round one game against La Rochelle you were key in that win and I suppose <laughs> looking at looking back at that performance you were taking the legs from under so many of the French <laughs> players it must have felt magnificent to put in such a good performance and it must have done wonders for your confidence after coming back after injury. Yeah, like definitely even during the injuries, I think you you sometimes you doubt yourself bits and bobs and you kind of just you kind of miss the, the big stage. So kind of getting back at it, I was uh, nervous going into it. My parents like my parents were off in Lanzarote, they were on their holidays, some <laughs> themselves and had a quick change of plans to get back to the to rainy La Rochelle. But um, you know, for me, being out there on the big stage again with, with, with the lads was huge. Um, like, it was uh, coming up against big players like Skelton, Antonio, these lads. It's it's something you kind of, you miss. And through the darker days, you kind of, you look at and you and you think about it and you're like, that's your drive. So getting out there was huge and I no, really enjoyed it. Talk about the chop tackling. What is your secret? And when did you decide to zone in on this skill? Because it's it's magnificent that you have this in your armory and it's what you're known for. Yeah, like when when I was in school, I went to school in Clongo Sector School and uh, our coach, Noel McNamara, who would be well known now, is over in Bordeaux. He's uh, coaching the backs there. He, he was kind of, he was a huge part of it. Uh, our team wasn't a very, very physical team, but... Um, he kind of drilled into us, kind of this low, this low chop, this low tackle. Like my other, my other mates, uh, from school are all the same. They they d- see it as why aren't other guys chopping? Yeah. Um, because that was kind of what was drilled yeah. into us. And then, um, through just other injuries and stuff, Hugh Hogan, another part of that, uh, he was a, he was a kind of breakdown coach in Leinster. He kind of drilled in these kind of habits, like we worked it at your injuries. But it's it's kind of. There's method to the madness as as crazy as people think I look when I'm flying, flying into knees. There has been has been years of trying to drill, drill some kind of like, uh, I don't know, footwork, kind of getting your your head in the right position. There's a lot to it. So and it's something you've clearly worked a lot at. Yeah, like it's been it's been kind of something through the years I've kind of worked at. I've now kind of gone on to look at it. through kind of the academic side of started a PhD in kind of looking at the tackle. Um, another Catherine Dane is another woman who uh, again on the rugby side of things is starting to look at the tackle as well or finishing up looking at the tackle on the a- academic side. So it's kind of been, it's been a kind of passion that I've always that I've always enjoyed and now I kind of want to see how do we how do we transfer it across mm-hmm. to kind of other players in the game and more lower down the leagues really more more towards like kids and stuff starting out rugby maybe not. The aggressive chop tackle would definitely bring the height down a little yeah, bit, 100%. I think. Is it something you ever use, Lindsay? I'm getting better actually as later on in my career because like you expend so much energy when it's so physical and you actually like it's an art. Like it is an art. I thought you were exceptional. I wanted this like kind of sniper, like or like a sound of a chopping scissors because anyone with white socks that day was just like Will Collins like yeah, yeah. and he's gone but it actually makes it easier for your team to turn around and then it puts pressure on obviously the attacker then to get in good position get back they have to clear rook so for a turnover ball and probably the style Leinster wants to play now with Jacques Nienenbauer and that line speed getting up off you have to be like perfect at it and I just think it makes the game more enjoyable and there's nothing better if you got a big man like Antonio yeah. or Will Skelton then you just absolutely take the legs <laughs> from under them because it's just like a big tree falling down so um, congrats on the PhD in the studies I saw Thank was you. this time last year was it you presented it yourself Catherine? Yeah Something yeah so yeah. we've kind of been tipping away through, uh, through the year so now it's uh, it's it keeps me tipping over on the side and uh, yeah now it's interesting and I've even seen kind of Catherine's work as well like she's been at it for a few years now and just seen kind of how much she's developed in that area, like the the tackling the women's game has been huge. So, 
like if I could have any amount of impact like she's had, um, I'd be I'd be delighted. Yeah, well, the best brilliant. of luck with yeah. it. And um, looking at Jack Nienaber, just as Lindsay mentioned him there, what has it been like for Leinster since he came in? We've seen your defensive system evolve over the past few months. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, I think having a two-time world champion coming into into the environment, which is already pretty competitive, is uh, has been huge. Um, what he he brings a crazy amount of energy, like the lads love it. We all love it. He just you kind of feed off him. Mm. Like he is, he's this passion for the game, especially around defense. That like you just really buy into. So like you know the the new system he's bringing in. It's a it's a, a lot, there's a lot of detail to it and it's tough to get get around but like it's like lads are 100 percent committed into buying into it and um, you can already see kind of small little glimpses of where it's coming mm. through um but yeah no it's uh, it's been it's been class all the focus of course now is going to be on the six nations your own ambitions in the green jersey you have nine caps to your name so far, injury has hampered your progression, I suppose, with the Ar- Irish team over the past number of years. What's your ambition for 2024 and beyond? Yeah, look, um, kind of just keep tipping away and, you know, hopefully get back in the jersey one day again. Um, you know, all I can kind of work at is, you know, kind of day to day, kind of showing up in Leinster. Every t- opportunity I get, just trying to represent myself as best as I can. Um, and then hopefully, you know, through, through kind of, that consistency that kind of persistence hopefully it, it opens up the opportunity again because like my parents never got to go to any of those games it was all during COVID yeah. um, oh. and it's, it's mad when you think back yeah like it was empty stadiums in the Stade de France all these and you're looking around to absolutely nothing and you know it's I, I dream of of standing there singing the anthems again looking up into the crowd and just seeing my parents and you know it's kind of a drive just to get back out there again and um, yeah, just kind of pick up, pick up where I left off. Well, hopefully it's not too far away. Well, looking at the Six Nations, Lindsay, <coughs> it's only a matter of days away. Yeah, Generally looking at the competition, first of all, it feels like it's a new era for a lot of these teams. So, you know, there's probably less expectation around what certain teams can achieve because of all the changes. And if we look at England first, it was a dismal Six Nations campaign for them last year. They finished fourth in the competition. Um, will they be able to continue on that upward trajectory? Because I suppose they surprised a lot of us with their performances in the World Cup because they were at such a low ebb going into that competition. They were. And it's it's a funny, like this time last year where everyone was basically, you know, whoever finished top of the Six Nations was going to win the World Cup. There was all this momentum build and now we're on a fresh, like four year start. Um, there's been a couple of changes, players in, out, retiring. Obviously, Andy Farrell's been named as coach. So there's lots of exciting news in it, but people probably don't know where to even start kind of dissecting it. And you actually never, and we'll know this, you never know where you're at, whether it's the Six Nations or URC. Like, you could put in all the training you want, but you never know where you're at until you're actually first test mm-hmm. game. So it'll be interesting. I think a lot of eyes will be on this Friday thinking the winners will be coming out of this. But, um, look, England are a very proud rugby nation. I'd be very surprised if they don't come in with a lot of work done under Steve Borthwick, who... who kind of got a raw end the deal like taking over so near to a World Cup and having yeah. to pick up the pieces after Eddie Jones there wasn't a lot of new English players kind of blooded over that time either and their style of play for me is I think one that's nearly left behind in the game Will can yeah, offer his opinion like it, the, the game is so quick now and the kicking game for territory and it's so quick and exciting but I felt they played a bit of a slower game and they just wanted to like tuck it up the jumper and yeah. get their game their game like that way so they've exceptional athletes like look how well their teams are doing in Europe that's it do you know what I mean like Sailor excellent six English teams yeah. through to the round of 16 yeah so I think they will be the surprise package and I think the pressure is still off them because no one's actually highlighted them I think the big talk for them is oh they've lost on Farrell and this is like a yeah. catastrophic um, but Mark Smith has been lightning up for Harlequin so if they can base the team around his style of play yeah. um then you never know what can happen. Yeah, will they do that, Will? Because I suppose Steve Borthwick's first year in charge, it was a very basic game plan and the focus really wasn't on this expansive attacking play. But as Lindsay said, if Marcus Smith is going to be in the driving seat now, will they look to evolve and kick on? Yeah, it's interesting to see how how they will approach it. I can still see them going with that kicking game and that air-free kind of force teams to make mistakes. And I think the way Harlequins and Northamptons have been playing probably 
opens up their counter attacking game mm. a bit more that you know they're able to stay in the fight for a lot longer and then that's the worry is that when it comes to the last 10 15 minutes that they have players that can do something exceptional you look at you look at how Marcus Smith's been playing you look even like Northampton the the fight they showed in Tom and Park with 14 men <coughs> Finn like, Smith I wonder yeah. will he get a game well that's the thing you know it's in, it's incredibly competitive mm. they have a lot of players that are you know properly at the top of their game at the moment so they're they're a team that you know I think everyone's going to be worried about um, and probably I'd say it's the media and stuff haven't probably seen as much of how they're going to come together and how they're going to see themselves as having a really good chance to win it so they, they'd be definitely a big worry in the Six Nations What will Felix Jones add to that coaching ticket? Well I don't know if anyone caught Steve Bortick's interviews last week he just said he just is rugby he's so intense and I think his experience from being uh, with South Africa to win, um, you bring that experience on. And then obviously his job now is to bring that experience into a, a team that suits the player pool that he has. And I think his job, I think he will add so much to it. Mm -hmm. So I think <laughs> Ireland's loss will be England's game or South Africa's loss now at this stage will be England's game. And I think he will play a big part um, in the resurrection possibly of English rugby. That's not what I'd like to say. Yeah. But I think he's going to he's, he's gonna absolutely add their first game is away to Italy and then they face Wales. So they could easily be two from two in the first two rounds and that would fill them with confidence and give them momentum. Yeah, and they definitely have confidence as well off the back of the World yeah. Cup. Um, like, they that was the toss of a coin if, like, them losing South Africa really, do you know, they really stayed in that fight. So I think they'd, they'd be kind of happy where they're sitting. Their club teams have gone well and um, the two first games they have, Every Six Nations game is tough, but they'll back themselves to, to kind of kick on from there. So, you know, they could be sitting pretty after two games. And, um, and you know, it's, it's it really throws the Six Nations up in the air how, how it's going to yeah. turn out. Italy then, they finished bottom of the Six Nations last year. And despite sp playing some exciting rugby and we saw how they pushed France close on the opening night in last year's competition, they really disappointed at the World Cup. So what are you expecting from them? You know, could they cause an upset? Um, I would hope they will get some win along the way. Not against Ireland, obviously, but I, I would like to see. There's always that look. It's like FA Cup or any of the knockout stages. You want the underdog to get this one win, you know, and I think they deserve it now at this stage. I think, unfortunately, Italy, they don't have the rugby DNA in, in their history, but they don't know sometimes I feel who they are or what style they want to yeah. play. They've great endeavour, they've great energy, they've great heart, but sometimes to manage games and finish them off or these small turning points which change the game for them um, has really killed them. And yeah, they should have beaten France last year. France just got over the line, but yeah. that that's what happens against experienced teams. They will find out a way to beat you. Um, they were probably very unlucky against England as well. They really, yeah. you know, came up and put a super fight. So, if they can kind of change some things, I think they will be very much hurting. Like, they're a proud nation. They'll be hurting after the World Cup and I don't think, well, I hope they can't go any lower. Do you know? Yeah. So the difficulty for them is they have three away games. So, what games will they really be focusing on, do you think? Oh, it's hard to know. Um, it's hard to know what they'll be looking at. They'll be going probably hard at that Wales game again. You, yeah. you can see where they took confidence over that. Um I think I think they'll back themselves. Uh, again, going back to club uh, rugby, like Benetton have been yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah, they've been really good all season, and they've kind of probably been um, tipping away slowly in the background. People probably haven't highlighted how well they've been going, but they're they're a proper challenge at the moment. And uh, I mean, Zebra have really kicked on from where they've been. So um, at club level, and all these players are within that. Um, they've they've probably been quite happy where how they've been going this season so how that comes together will yeah. be interesting but see for me i think say Fexo now is is over there so to have and off the back of a really good season with munster the italians is great but he's the experience they nearly yeah. binds them all together yeah. but where do they get that player at international level that's going to do that yeah for they have the so likes I, of garbisi tomaso allen capuosa yeah. so they they will be relying on their key players 100 yeah. percent but we probably need others to step up yeah. for them. Like Will makes a great point. They are absolutely doing fabulous in the URC. They're now the kind of teams that are really hard to beat. They're not these guaranteed wins yeah. or points that other teams or the teams would have picked up over the years. But for me, I think that's where Italy are missing just this. Um, I suppose like whether it's in the centre or a half back pairing, like you have to have this general who'll direct you and just get mm -hmm. you over the line, manage the game, 
and they have to look at not playing the same style of rugby against every nation. They have well, to look they at the try Achilles heel. To s- still kick on from the style of play that Kieran Crowley was trying to implement under the new coach um, Gonzalo Quesada. I don't know because I don't know whether it suits them like it just didn't they didn't seem to well they definitely looked to be unrest last year for me like taken off as captain and he's having a you know hissy fit on the side of the pitch you just emotions are high but you to me that looked like a break in trust yeah. a break in communication and there was something there was an undertone there for me yeah. Um, and when there's an undertone that within any team you're not going to get them to play like that's a big thing um, isn't it culture and yeah. how your team play together and mm-hmm. how you can actually what personality comes through when your backs are against the wall and that's the big thing and I don't think that personality shone through for me yeah. when Italy's backs were against the wall in the World Cup like it didn't seem like a solid team um, so I think the change would be good for them and look the good thing for them is everyone wishes them well and they'll come in with grey heart and they're always a team you just want them to do well so I do do hope now the change is for the better and they'll get at least one win two would be even nice but yeah. uh, I can't see them finishing hard in the bottom of the table again. Well, Wales entered the competition after performing, I suppose, better than we expected at the Rugby World Cup. Warren Gatland has drafted in a lot of young players. A lot of experience has left the team now. Um, It's hard to know (laughs) what they'll come out like because the regions are performing so badly. But Warren Gatland has this power to bring these players together and get the best out of them. What are you expecting from Wales? Yeah, they're a proud nation. Um, when they play in the red jersey, they're incredibly difficult to beat. No matter what their what their kind of season has been like before, um, any time they show up, you you can't take them for granted. And I I, I do think they probably have um, a lot to prove at the moment. They they'd be frustrated with how obviously the club scene and everything has been going back in Wales and how that's kind of being handled and. I think they'll look to to kind of represent themselves as best they can in the, in the Welsh jersey and kind of show the nation like what rugby means to them because you know it's a very proud rugby nation and you know the Millennium Stadium when that's mm-hmm. when that's rocking it's it's hard to hard to come away with a win. It's definitely the beginning of a complete rebuild with Welsh rugby now. Yeah. So in a way there's no pressure on them and that's when they're dangerous. Yeah. Captain's a new 20, he's 21. Yeah, one of the youngest yeah. captains ever. Mm-hmm. Ever, and I think that's setting uh, Welsh's, the Wales stall out. They're just kind of saying, yeah, we have to start again. This is really very much a very new era in this, um, in the short of the Red Dragon. And I think no pressure on them. Um, And we'll probably go back to Mike Ross's comment about Joe McCarthy, like ignorance is bliss. So for a young for a young man going in with no, no pressure, no experience, they'll just relish playing. Yeah. And you know what? I said last week, mistakes brings experience and what better stage to make those on. And I think for last week's launch, everyone's favourite stadium, a lot of the answers were the Millennium Stadium. So I believe when the roof is closed mm-hmm. and everyone's in there and the place is hopping, I think they can make it a fortress again. Like Will said, Welsh rugby, they adore the rugby. So they're proud and I think they'll come out all guns blazing and have a point to prove. And I think it'll be nice for them Maybe to get a proverbial two fingers to say, yeah, well, the old guard are gone and we're going to start a new era and we're going to start it with a win. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what they can probably do now to start yeah. this um, yeah, new era off. In Warren, they trust, though. They they always seem to rely on him and go back to the old guard. Will he stick to what works best for him? Will we see the same style of play, the Warren ball and sticking it up the jumper, that kind of approach again? Yeah, I can't see them deviating f- far from what they know. Um, and it's kind of especially, mind you, having kind of young talent in there does kind of spice up the game a bit. You, but like that's what they as well rely off. You always see they kind of took it up, kind of keep trucking away, like even during the World Cup, like massive defensive efforts. And then you have players in the back line that can kind of do something mm-hmm. different. So I definitely think they won't go far from what they know. Yeah. Um but again, when the young players kind of coming into the whole system, they can they can change it up as well. Yeah. What does a successful Six Nations look like for Wales then? Oh God, if they finish third behind yeah. kind of well, whoever tops kind of I I would think uh, whoever comes out of the comp the battle now this Friday between Ireland and France, we're probably looking at them winning it, and I would think then if Wales came third, I think that would be an excellent finish for them now. To be honest, at that stage. Yeah. Um, but even fourth wouldn't be bad for them mm-hmm. if they've th- when they've so many changes. So yeah, third or fourth, third would be I think their best expectation for this going in. 
on to Scotland, the only side to name co-captains. Why do you think they went with that approach? Well, I suppose, yeah, Leinster, we've done the same as well. Um, I think from my, like my whole understanding of the situation is because you have kind of like in Leinster, you'd have James Ryan who understands what's going on in the pack and stuff and mm. his communication then with the referee over things around the scrum and um, areas like that. And then obviously Gary has a different uh, look at the game as well and mm. talking around different kind of styles of the game. So it's the two different messages that they can kind of come together and they can be more coherent and it's two lads that understand the game differently. And to be honest, it's, it's probably not been... Um, taken on so well uh, referees kind of want maybe just one voice um, so I don't know how how, uh, how it's going to work with Scotland um, but um, how do you find that as players it's it's perfect like it's what we want because I know that like if there's a prop now as if there's someone going on in the scrum that he can go to James James understands it and he can feed it back to the referee whereas if you're going to like say a back um, and you, you're saying something around the scrum it's probably message and gets kind of lost around it yeah. and then the refs don't like when you're coming out of a scrum and you're kind of shouting some hinging or some yeah. kind of foul play and it's just like a lot of voices end up kind of spoiling the whole whole thing so um, the the logic behind it is that to have more clearer kind of more coherent messaging coming from mm. from the captains and yeah because the way rugby's developed over the years backs to forwards is nearly not like American football but it's becoming more and more yeah. distant so that's it's just clear messages really and does it change anything for you in the build up to game day no they, for us it's uh, like two two incredible captains you know both of them lead by example and both of them the messages they deliver are, are you know they're they're emotional they're they're to the point and they, they kind of you have two different voices that are kind of feeding the whole build up to it and kind of controlling the whole um, the whole approach to the game and it gives more of a player led approach as well I feel like when you have the two of them kind of leading it um, coaches have more trust that they can kind of stand off um, like it hasn't happened yet but say if if one of them gets emotionally overcharged and doesn't you know doesn't really find kind of find his game or whatever you have another man to kind of back it up mm. so it's 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 a good system for, like for players yeah. to kind of buy into. For Scotland, does it indicate in any way that they're lacking natural leaders perhaps? Maybe a little bit or the same thing. Sometimes it just takes the pressure off this one person to deliver, whether it's a message to a referee or um, even a team talk. And some, some players might have different... I like the concept of... Because obviously I'm an ex-run throw, so when you have someone who's leading you know we normally have a pack leader but it, when you have someone like James Ryan who does understand the scrum so well and there's something happening that you just cannot you know you need to get the re referee to have a look at and highlight I think it's a good one it's obviously caused unfortunate um, bit of fiasco when he wouldn't talk to James Ryan at one yeah. stage but um, yeah I would think Scotland now I'm interested to see how they're going to go like even yeah. after I've obviously watched the first episode of um, Full Contact and Finn Russ is a bit of a messer like do you know yeah. that way and Obviously, he's named as, as one half of that. So um, maybe lack leaders, but I doubt it international rugby either. I just think personally, it's just that's what they've gone with. They're going to probably try it. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it plays out. Scotland would be hugely disappointed with their Rugby World Cup exit um, against Ireland. What kind of form do they bring into the competition? Yeah, it's, it's hard to know. I think the frustrations of the World Cup for them kind of, you know, channel something for them to kind of, you know, because they obviously had big aspirations going into the World mm -hmm. Cup um, and they're, they have the players around them to do do magical things. So I think for them, they're going into the World Cup and like every every year for them, I think they do they do back themselves to go the whole mm -hmm. way. It's yeah. probably backing it up with consistency and, and seeing how that plays out. But yeah, look, it's always a tough game against Scotland. Um, again, Scotland on their day um, can beat anyone. Um, yeah. and that that is the that is the worry um, but it's again just for them backing it up yeah there seems to always be an air of optimism around the Scottish team when they're going into competitions is this the year that we'll see them step it up a level they have England and France in Murrayfield I don't know because uh, last season was the first time they'd won the first two rounds in their history I think going into the competition so they were big wins but um, 
yeah, they're they're tough places to go. Like even of obviously chatting about our prospects, you're kind of going, all right, we're going now to the Va- Stad Velodrome this week, and then we'd be um in Twickenham for England, and they're two really hard places to go. Um, so I'm not sure with the away fixtures for them. Again, I could see them finishing third, depending on how they got in. Mm. So it'd be interesting to see now. And finally, on to Ireland and France. Ireland have spent uh, the last week in Portugal. The first port of call, I suppose, would have been to look back at the Rugby World Cup. And Simon Easterby was saying that they didn't make the most of the opportunities in that game. So they know they weren't far off when they came up against New Zealand. Um, What learnings will they take from that now and what will they do differently? Yeah, like the like the game is just made off such small margins. Um, you even look at from a Leinster point of view, you look at our previous finals against La Rochelle, like it's all small bounces of ball and it was mm-hmm. the same with the it was the same with the quarter final there, you know, it's uh there's not a lot, um not a lot you can look back and change. Um there's obviously small mistakes and stuff, but there was nothing huge where you said, Oh, that was yeah. the game changer there. Like unfortunately, the rub of the green sometimes doesn't go your way in rugby, and to be honest, that's that's to me personally what it felt like that day. You know, everything they delivered on a lot of what they would have would have gone into that game wanting mm-hmm. to do, and it's just sometimes sometimes things don't go your way. So I don't think I don't think they'll look back and look at a lot of fix ups. I just think they need to they look at trusting their process, trusting what they've what what our Irish rugby has become over the last number of years, um, and really having that belief that you know like Ireland still is like one of the top teams in world Mm. rugby well it'll be very difficult for Ireland to pick up exactly where they left off because we have Johnny Sexton missing of course that's a whole lot of tactical nows and leadership gone from the team how will that impact them do you think Lindsay um He'll be a huge impact. I mean, no one's going to sugarcoat that. There is and uh, only ever will be one Johnny Sexton. I think he was a, just an exceptional player, yeah. how he read the game, his passion for it, um, how he could change a game. So I think his experience and the he was just different gravy in, in how he played. Look, he's so flat to the game line. And probably, to be fair to him, the nearest player who's come up, Keen Prendergast is definitely someone who he just reminds me of him so much. He's in with the training camp. Which Sam Prendergast. Or oh, bro- sorry, Sam, uh, Sam yeah. not keen. I did this two weeks ago as well with the <laughs> Prendergast, but apologies, Sam, at 10 for Leinster, obviously. Um, so he's doing great and, again, plays on the game line, so languid, so confident, knows the game so well, but is able to pick the game apart. And I think that's the difference. So you will get a pitch map, you'll get a game plan, but if you can see something to open up a gap or take a spot and open the game up to provide a chance for your teammates, that's what we're going to need. And that's what Johnny Sexton did and created. Um, excuse me so I think Jack Crowley is, is obviously going to start I would mm. think at 10 and I think he's another guy who's well able to play he has confidence he's well able to take the pressure on his shoulders um, plays in the game line puts people through gaps um, but he will have to find his feet and he can't fill the shoes of Johnny Sexton yeah. he has to fill his own shoes he has to fill his own boots with confidence and play his game along with implementing the game plan that Andy Farrell and, and his team have, have created so um. I don't see, I think there's enough experience there now to, it'll be a tough transition, we will yeah. miss him, but I think there's players there and it's it's now a new era and time for players to step up. And I'm excited to see who's gone. It's been a burning question, hasn't it? It's been hanging for nearly, definitely the last 18 months, you know, yeah. when he announced, you know, his down to retirement and questions over when he would. Um, but it's now time that we just have to rip off the bandit, I think. Yeah. Uh, since Lindsay mentioned Sam Prendergast there, for you playing with him in Leinster, what do you see? Ah, uh, he's a class act, uh, Sam. Um, I think he's he's a good Kildare man, firstly. So, <laughs> yeah, good blood in the, in the in the body, but he, uh, I don't know, he just has a confidence and a bit of an aura around him. Um, I played kind of, I played his first game when he was over at Lions in South Africa, um, and he, for such a young lad, he just carried that game with him. You know, he. He had leadership. He was kind of dictating what what we were doing. You know, he just had that bit about him. Um, and then even in training, you see him kind of pulling off these little flashy moves and stuff. He just has a bit of X factor to him that you know you can't, you can't, uh, you can't teach. So no. I don't know. He's he's very exciting. But even in saying that, uh, you have like Harry Ross, Frawley, um, and then like all these lads coming through. So like Crowley as well. Like mm-hmm. there's a good pick of lads there that are all going to be gunning mm-hmm. for that number ten shirt and. 
you know if it was if we're looking at the looking at just one person to take it she'd be feel like it's a lot of pressure but there's so many lads mm. going for that one jersey that it's going to drive them all on to get better and you know we could have a, another Johnny Sexton in a few years there Focusing on the game against France now Friday night we can't wait for it what will the main areas of improvement be for Ireland do you think will they be focused on the set piece in particular Yeah I think away from home your set piece has to be key so scrum and line, line out and then your breakdown like France are going to be coming at us all guns blazing I think now um, is it a stat that we've whoever's won the first game between these two have won the, the Six Nations so I think this game will be key to to whoever wants to whether us retain the title or, or France win the back office Um, so I think it'll be big key I would see some big calls with the likes of probably Joe McCarthy maybe coming That's in at second row if we're focused on the set piece will there be a change of personnel well I think they're going to probably go for a big pack like for um, the physicality side of it because I think it's just going to be an absolute war of attrition in that sense so if we can re- win front football and win it at breakdown and set piece and give a launch pad for our backs I think that's going to be key to the s- success of this game but you see the thing about say Joe McCarthy is he's such a big guy but he's so mobile yeah. do you know he's a, like another back row there playing in second row and like James Ryan's not slow either do you know so when you say we're picking big men we've big men who are athletes who can actually play so now you're back five or nearly like an all f- like you know loose forwards and that makes the game very very exciting and like Andrew Porter could he's like a mini version of a back row yeah. this stage he's playing <laughs> so well do you know so and then you've Jan Sheehan so um, but if Joe McCarthy gets in there he gets the nod who misses out it's such a big call oh, I, I don't know it's that's the thing it's incredibly competitive Um. Yeah, a lot, a lot of lads got like a lot of lads gunning for the same positions, and that's that's what you want in mm. in these kind of team selections. You want headaches, you want lads coming in off uh, out of club teams having played really well, and that's that's where Ireland are at at the moment. Thankfully, it's a fairly um, fairly fit panel. There's not not many injuries there, so you know I think this fair Andy Farrell is probably exactly where he wants to be. He wants those headaches. Is there a scenario that he starts on the bench or if we go with McCarthy, that does he need to start from the start? Well, I don't know because like, then you're like Tyke Byrne. And this is the thing, even the conundrum with the 10. Do you know, I think we picked Jack Crowley for a 10 with Munster because he hasn't really had competition but poor Leinster are like, deciding who, who is the 10. Do you know that way? So it's the same thing. Will will he go with experience with Tyke Byrne and the partnership that was played in the World Cup with himself and, and James Ryan? Um and I think they will be key and then leave McCarthy on the, ben- on the bench and probably go for a 6-2 split with a, a more forward base bench than, okay. than back. So I think possibly he'll start on the bench and maybe Tyburn starting uh, as the experience. But I think he will have a role to play in this match. <laughs> I think yeah. he will be a man who will, if he comes off the bench, he'll come on to change the game, to finish the game out or to bring a headache of all headaches now to the French team. Imagine 60 minutes in, 50 minutes in you're absolutely flogged you know taking all these tackles and then big Joe McCarthy comes off the bench to just run at you <laughs> you know <laughs> the other big question mark is of course on the wing with Mac Hansen out um, you were speaking last week Lindsay you felt like Calvin Lash am I right in saying yeah, was I think he runner. deserves. yeah I think he deserves um, he's playing some exceptional foot, um, like rugby and even in the Northampton game, anything, he's lively. He's lively. He made things happen. He's involved. And I think ever since he went down to that New Zealand tour with the likes of Kieran Frawley for this emerging talent, say with Jack Crowley, they need test game experience. And I think the only question mark is, is it fair to give him his first kind of cap as such senior level against France away in the velodrome? Do you know? So there's talk of Gary Ringrose maybe going in and then changing. Well, what does the Larmer bring to the wing then? He has that experience as well. He has that yeah. footwork. Yeah, it's been great this season seeing Jordan getting back to just true injuries and everything. He's had a frustrating last few seasons and he's playing is, well. Yeah, he's playing class. You know, his his footwork is something that like you hate when you're one on one with him. Mm. <laughs> yeah. he, he just you don't know where he's gonna go, and that's been something that he's always had, and he's kind of stuck to it. So like, you know. I'd love to see him just keep continuing mm. his form. And that's the thing, again, Calvin's been class as well and Jacob as well. These lads have all been playing really good rugby. So mm. you can't, you, it's hard to pick, mm. hard to pick who's going to come through on it because it's fine margins what the decision will be made of. Because um, when you look at the season so far, they've all, they all have something different and they've all, you know, they've all been playing to the best of probably of that they've played in 
through their time. So it's been it's ex- it's exciting to see how that that'll turn out. Do you think he'll go with a winger as opposed to moving Gary Ringrose out? I'd like to see because I'm going to say probably with Ramos in there, which will probably be involved. Our France going to play a lot of kicking games, and we could probably get a lot from counter attack rugby. So that's changing your soil of selection then as well to see what France are going to throw at you. So. Um, that's what you'd like to see that, and that's probably what they're going to base the team on like where are France weak where, what style of play are they going to play how can we counteract that so um, no I'd probably like to see an out and out winger but the thing is mm. Gary Ringrose defensively is so experienced um, so yeah I'd like to see him probably but it would be good to develop a few absolutely. more players absolutely I don't think we can um, what do you say cement over cracks I think I'd like to see Gary stay at 13 mm. and continue that partnership yeah. with Bundiaki um, and then maybe give Calvin or I think Jordan Amherst has had he, he definitely has the right to put up his hand I think he's having a great start to the season and he's definitely back to his best so I think it'll come down to maybe positioning what style France are going to play because um, defence will come in as well on the on the wing so you're not only looking at attacking style wingers who's who's good defensively and positionally yeah. um, especially if they're going to play a kicking game against us um, on to Crowley then you touched on it already but there's huge pressure on him I suppose to fill Johnny Sexton's boots and nobody is going to be able to fill those boots but what can Crowley do if we presume he's going to be taking the reins on Friday night what can he do early on to lay down a marker and settle into this game yeah I don't, I, you don't yeah you don't want him playing outside of what he's been doing like kind of mm-hmm. stick to what he knows and that's the thing he's been having a, good, a really good season so far um and kind of trust in the process, trust in, you know, he has a big pack in front of him. And know. he has Jameson Gibson Park as well inside him, which is so important. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. So you don't want you you don't want him to feel like the pressure's on where he has to do something magic. Um because we know when he gets his confidence he can do something he, something really good, but you don't want you want him to just feel feel himself into the game, kind of trust the process, trust the kind of game plan, and that's what he's gonna do, you know. There's um there's there's a great selection on who will be of other tens, you know, if if there's so whoever will be on the bench, who knows? Um, they'll also have kind of a cam head on them as well. So, you know, again, we're looking at the options we have at ten. There's a there's not the there's not obviously Johnny Sexton to pick up anymore, but there's a really, really good good bunch of lads to pick from. Yeah, Kieran Frawley, we have to mention him because his name has come up so often. If we're looking maybe at the backup to Hugo Keenan and we don't want any scenario where Hugo Keenan is out injured, but who fits that role? Is it Frawley? And how, as playing from playing with him, how does he feel about being this utility player? Yeah, like Frawley is the kind of guy that you know he just kind of takes anything. You know, if you're like tomorrow, you're playing second row tomorrow. You'd be like Grant, motor on. <laughs> um, he's just kind of he's and he'd excel at it as well. Exactly, that's the thing. He's a class act, um, and you know he had a huge amount of experience at 15 and then he's played a lot a lot of 15 this year for us and he's been he's been unreal so that's the thing I think he can take confidence from from his own ability that he's able to kind of wherever he gets put into he's going to do a really good job at it and if if that's 10 if that's 15 um, it's, it's going to play out well from and that's the thing is Crowley can also play in that kind of 15 position all these players have like Jimmy O'Brien again, a lad who could play anywhere in the in the back line. And obviously he's he's out injured at the moment, but like another good Kildare man. Exactly, another good <laughs> Kildare man. You have to you have to plug the Kildare man. <laughs> Find the flag yeah, today. Exactly, well. yeah, exactly. Uh, but the a back now is able to do a lot more jobs than kind of just kind of mm. that w- that one role that they like. Even Hugo throw him into hooker or something. He'd, be, he'd fly <laughs> it. So. So no, I think I think you look at the you look at the backs that we have at the moment. There's a lot of lads that can kind of move into different positions, which is which is great to have. On to the French, you were talking about their weaknesses. Where are their weaknesses? <laughs> Who knows? They're missing a lot of players, of course. Dupont, they have Entomac, out, Jalange, um, Flamand, Miofu, Miafu. I um I mean, mm-hmm. and that's a lot of quality missing, but they still have such quality in that side and when you look at the players that have been lighting it up in Europe with Toulouse and Bordeaux <sighs> yeah. you know they're a very Chalibre. dangerous mm. prospect yeah. yeah like I just think he has been absolutely exceptional for Bordeaux and um, they're the most exciting team I've seen other than obviously our own Leinster um, in the in the group stage is like some of their rugby and how they keep the ball alive and I think he's been key to that he's definitely grown he looks a lot more confident um, and sure he wasn't half bad in the World Cup either so yeah, you can take out, and they're big names to take out. I th- like 
Jelange obviously was heavily involved with Toulouse so to see him go so close to the tournament is is a pity yeah. um, and obviously um, I'm a very big fan of Dupont to be honest um, I, I like that he's so unpredictable and he could try anything but um, I think he will I think he would be a big loss to him for just what he brings his energy his captaincy how he reads the game and I think everything that he feed like they feed off him so I'm interested to see how that impacts I don't think like it, they're not going to lack quality to replace mm. him he, he's different again he's a different level but I think he's different for me in because the French are kind of petulant and we haven't seen that so much uh, with him and I think that's because his attitude he, he's not petulant he just he gets knocked down he gets back up he tries something mm-hmm. and he's just he just loves he's just a man who loves playing his rugby Um. So I think that's been a he's been a huge contributor to how the French attitude around themselves and they're working hard now. You know they've they brought in um oh Sean I can't remember his second name as defensive coach the English um the ex- Welsh oh, or the ex uh, Sean, Sean Sean Edwards yeah so he I think he as well has brought something different to them um to sort of just ground them do you know yeah. so they they could win dirty last year like that Italy win was a dirty win but I think that just propelled them into the rest of the tournament you know yeah they've handed the captaincy to Gregory Aldred and he really looks completely refreshed after that taking that time out post World Cup yeah like again you look at the the strength and depth France have they they lose one possession one player like and someone else fills in like Luku again has been a class act Mm -hmm. for Bordeaux and um he kind of fills a lot of the kind of gaps that Dupont would be leaving behind um Again, around French teams, like around France, is all about controlling momentum, um, like fronting up to them physically, not being ill-disciplined, um, because that's what they thrive off. Um, they thrive off kind of cheap penalties, kick to the corner, kind of back their set piece, um, switching off kind of around the rock, and you can, that's where you always saw like Dupont really come alive. He has kind yeah. of big, big forwards coming off his shoulder, and he kind of picks one lad off hits a big carrier into a seam, start building momentum. And that's kind of where, obviously, Ireland will look to slow them down to. And that's the thing. We have great, great players to do that, you know, get them down early, lads over the ball. Um, like Josh, you can see all these lads who have had big moments. Pete, um, that's where you kind of control France. Um, and, and that'll be probably the big challenge that we'll be looking at. Um, so... In terms of the in terms of losing players, they have big players to fill in there. Mm. But um, again, it's it's for Ireland and for France. There's big names that have dropped, but the exciting thing is seeing the guys coming in to fill those gaps. Yeah, and France are in the same boat as Ireland in the sense that we spoke about Ireland's quarter final exit, but it's probably more crushing for France since it was a home World Cup. So how will they reflect on how the World Cup finished from them, and what will they bring from that? What learnings will they be bringing into this competition? Well, th- they're hugely proud. They're a hugely proud nation and they will, I suppose that's their biggest failing. They will feel that they didn't bring home a, like a World Cup on, on home soil. So um, I think they won't change much. They'll continue to build on the momentum. I mean, they were an exceptional team coming into it and throughout. And that final game against South Africa was so exciting. So you know? exciting. And I see more exciting days from them. Like again, going back to club rugby and, and what we've seen them, that's not going to really deviate. So they're just going to build on that. But I would think... Um, probably trying to maybe pick teams apart like Will said um, and I think they'll be a bit more ruthless I, th- I just I think they will come out yeah. to really be ruthless for the Six yeah. Nations and remind everybody that you know that was kind of maybe their mistake rather than teams beating them you know that they nearly beat themselves they're bookies favourites for Friday night um, but having the game played in Marseille as opposed to the Stade de France will that have any bearing on it do you think? No, I, I still think wherever France travel um, around France, you know, there's always a huge, huge turnout. Um, and I think they, they travel well within, like even see the 20s games, they yeah. kind of get moved around a bit. There's always the huge crowds. Well. Exactly. Yeah. The win- like, and they were s- I was listening to Gregory Aldred, actually, sorry, couldn't cross you there. Well, he was saying that they're embracing going into their communities and going out to the fans. So that's how they're framing it, that they'll, they'll get to go to see their fans in different places in France as opposed to them coming to them, that they're tr- the travelling team now. Exactly. Like to them, the south of France is where the heart of rugby is for for them. You know, up north there's not as many teams. So they're going down to like, I suppose, rugby country for them. Um, so it doesn't really, it doesn't really take away any home advantage for them. Um, they'll definitely still thrive off the opportunity to have an Ireland, Ireland on their home patch. And that's that's why it's going to be a, a, a cracking game because I think 
between between both teams it's it's hard to call where where it's going to go for the Leinster players who have been getting used to Jack Niederbauer's defensive system do you expect to see any changes there with Simon Easterby or will he be sticking to what they've done up until now um i the the systems are slightly different but they both are matched in the intent and the aggressive nature of how they're how they're done so i don't think anything will change in that perspective i think like simon simon brings like a huge amount of edge to to the defense which he'll want lads to carry back with them um and you know going hard at the ball um getting lads down early so as much as they're probably slightly different systems they still both are matched by the same intensity same kind of aggressive line speed that um that we've kind of seen being implemented in Leinster with us but um it definitely I think will take take uh, the defense up another level which would be exciting on to predictions now guys <laughs> Lindsay the expectation is and you've said it already that the winner of Friday's game will go on to win the tournament are there any other teams that could change that narrative I think they're all the unknown. I think I think for me, uh, maybe I'm giving them too much credit, but I think England could be a surprise package. Personally, they have a lot of home games. Um, like they're playing ourselves at home, like they will f- see that and as a, as an advantage for them. I think again, they probably were so unlucky in that um match against South Africa. They did they did deserve to win it. So they built through the tournament momentum, and I think on the back of that World Cup, they have to come back with a lot of positives from it and I think with the way the club teams are going um, mm-hmm. I think they will think they can they can upset the apple cart now um, but we won't look too far ahead I think this Friday France have to be favourites for me going in um, it's always hard to go away to France um, I'll tip Ireland to win it but I have to say France will be heavy favourites but I'll stick I'll stick with <laughs> our, ourselves Ireland have never won a five or six nations after the World Cup can we read anything into that Will what are you expecting I'd say if you asked anyone in the squad, they wouldn't know that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, I thought it was a yeah, great yeah, stat. No, yeah, 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 Don't yeah. beat me up with it. Yeah, no, it's a, it, <laughs> We're very yeah. impressive. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut it down. But <laughs> Ridiculous Actually, stat. he just yes. chopped at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Verbally. Classic well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think the, the lads are back, back the process, back what they've been doing. Um, and again, going over to France, they'll, they'll love that challenge they have. They've been in, in Portugal for the last couple of days now mm-hmm. and another few days of it like being in to get in each other's company um kind of i think it's an exciting challenge that they'll be looking forward to um yeah i'm i back ireland all the way for it you, can, you i can't see outside of that um, and will we see a grand slam this year it's very tough but i think we'll go a long way with a win on friday i think yes if we can get the win friday and depending on the performance uh, but it's hard i think it'll be based on the fact that how our injury count is by the time we go into the england match um but I think what will be key is how confident we can get the likes of Crowley and our systems playing. Mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, if we can get set piece right and get good clean ball, look after our rooks, I think we will give the French problems. But that has to be continuous. And it's very hard with such intense period to do that. Consent- like very few teams. I think we've only won four Grand Slams in, in our whole like history. And if yeah. you think that's over 100 years or whatever, am I right with that? I'm open for correction but for such a long period of the competition we've only ever won it four times do you know yeah. so when you put it into perspective it's just a hard thing to do but I think if we get the win Friday yeah maybe it'll, it'll go a long way what try. players are you most excited to see from an Irish perspective throughout the tournament oh, that's a tough question um, I'm excited to see them all um, I know I, lo- I love like watching um, like lads like Hugo um and like Kale and these lads are they've become the spine of the team and I love just seeing how they keep growing and growing and they're a big part of like how Ireland they're doing and they're playing great rugby at the moment so you know seeing them kind of kick on but like even um, around the whole 10 conversation like Crowley, Frawley, Harry Ross and then mm-hmm. even Tro Prendo into the mix there like there's a really exciting kind <coughs> of mix of players there and it's it's going to be exciting to see how that plays out in Ireland, but even just through the provinces, um, seeing how they keep kicking on as players because they're all in their own way class acts, and I think it's a, it's a great, great thing for Ireland to have such, such exciting players in that position. Lindsay, anyone in particular for you? Um, I'm excited to see, probably. Crowley to see how he goes at ten, and I know we've a lot of options at ten, but I think we probably need to 
stick with one to give them time to blood in, which is very harsh on those who do deserve a crack as well. Um, I'm excited to see John McCarthy. Um, I think he'll really, really light things up. And I'm really excited to see him. James Lowe back. I always love uh, yeah. to see him. I just think he always brings such excitement. Had a great game. And same thing, if Caden Doris can replicate his performance there against Stade Francais, uh, I thought he was exceptional. So I think he would be a big key as well for us. But to be uh, all the lads really, I'm excited to just get it started again and kick off for the next couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, definitely some, just to see how they dip their toe in the water, yeah. I suppose, and, and settle into a new era in Irish rugby. Yeah, and well, I'm certainly excited to see it all unfold. My thanks to Lindsay and to Will. We leave it there for today. We'll be back next week on House of Rugby to look back on round one of the Six Nations. Until then, from all of us here, Slonga Fold. Sports Show presents House of Rugby.